Marriage is the meeting of two profoundly different stories. We all have experienced loss, heartache, and shame, and those experiences affect how we show up in our most intimate relationships. If you and your partner would like to discover more about your stories, learn to have courage in conflict, and engage one another with more kindness and care, then we invite you to join us for the Marriage Conference in Park City, Utah. At this two-day conference, you'll experience teaching from Dr. Dan Allender and Becky Allender, co-founders of the Allender Center, and Dr. Steve Call and Lisa Call, co-founders of the Reconnect Institute. Whether you've been married for many years, are in a long-term relationship, are single, dating, or preparing to be married, this conference is for anyone who desires deeper relationships with others and with God. This is more than just a conference. It is an experience where you can move beyond techniques and how-tos to deepen your understanding of your stories and begin to create a stronger marriage marked by kindness, care, and courage. Join us for the Marriage Conference, October 13th and 14th, in beautiful Park City, Utah. Limited seating is available, so reserve your spot today at theallendercenter.org slash marriage. Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. We're going to invite you as an audience to address the reality that we need to be mothered and we need to be fathered, whether we have children, whether we have a partner, uh, we need to be mothered and we need to be fathered. And equally, we need to mother and father. We need to have those categories richly and deeply in mind as we're engaging one another. And I, I would say even more so at times, we need to sibling one another. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to befriend one another. And these categories, even when they're in concrete, clear relational structures called a family, we also have to engage the reality that no one, no one, no one will be mothered as they were meant to be, nor fathered. So mm -hmm. we're, we're in both a very important topic, but also one that uh, has far less conversation than I think we could be in. And so, mom, <laughs> I'm wondering what you're thinking when you bear the incredible privilege of two mm. beautiful stepsons and mm -hmm. a beautiful, beautiful daughter. So as we step into this parenting conversation, which really is the eternal need, the eternal privilege, but also the eternal reality that parenting never stops. Mm. So. Tell me what you're beginning to think as we step into this rather, <laughs> uh, shall we say, very intimate topic for you yeah. at this point. Yeah, it is very intimate, and it's um, it, it all it all feels very um, fresh and very like tangible and embodied and new, right? I mean, I've been a step parent now for a few years, so I've I've certainly been parenting. Um, and I would say even before that, we've talked about this, like I've been mothering for most of my life. So like it, there's some reality. I mean, that eternal, like the etern, eternity or eternal reality of parenting is like, yeah, that actually feels very true. But I would say, you know, I've been referring to this season of birthing a, a tiny human and, you know, who's now eight months old as, as like a holy breaking. It is a holy breaking. Um, and I don't know if we talk about that reality of, of parenting enough. And it's a holy breaking from the very minute, you know, there is, there is life growing. Um, and so, yeah. And, and, and I'm grateful to start with that reality of needing 
to be mothered and fathered always. But I would say in this season, it, this strange paradox that in order to really parent Evelyn well, to parent my stepsons well, I need so much mothering and fathering. Like, mm-hmm. so, like, I've never felt more of a need, especially in the newborn season. I just was like, man, if I could be surrounded by a village of women right now who are just mothering the crap out of me, like, that would feel like maybe that would give me enough to pour myself out in the ways that I am needing to pour myself out yeah. and to hold on to myself in the spaces where I am being exposed in ways that feel again, like a holy breaking, Mm -hmm. like there's such a holiness to it. And there's such a like breaking to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is not what you wish often to say to a new born. Well, let's put it a, a parent of a newborn that this stunningly beautiful child will break your heart and expose your deepest failures and transform your life in some degree of what could be called redemptive ruin. But that's what I hear you saying, holy breaking. You know, like babies are so beautiful. I I think when we had a chance to meet Evie face to face, instead of over Zoom, just, I mean, we were all just literally watching her (laughs) exist and captured. We could have sat there for hours, and we Mm -hmm. did, uh, to just be enraptured. So to be in the presence of fire, to be in the presence of water moving, Mm and the presence of a baby, you're Mm -hmm. in the presence of a kind of taste of eternity. And I think as glorious that is, we don't want to tell the other side. And that is, it will break you. Uh, And not just in the newborn era. No, (laughs) no. (laughs) Because I'm like, we have an emerging teenager. (laughs) We have a preteen. I'm watching all of you who have adult children. I'm watching my parents parent adult children. Like we've talked about this on the podcast. Like, no, it never ends. No. And the moment, even if it's illusory, the moment you have a sense of what is what what it means to be a good parent in this particular era moment in that child's life. Damn it, they age. <laughs> <laughs> Which you want them to do, but nonetheless, it opens up the reality that the parenting of the two year old is not the same as I mean, this is so obvious, and yet the notion that we're the parent consistent through every era. Well, I think that's I can say um, being in the first year of life, how much parenting and the needs for parenting change, you know, from newborn to like four month old to six month old. I mean, we've talked about this because Evie started crawling at six months, like when there's mobility, like what? And I think you're right. Like the minute you feel like, OK, we've got this, like we know how to do this, like the topography changes, the contours change, the the landscape changes and the little human changes and then you change and it's just a constant learning curve. <laughs> yeah. And if, if it, from my standpoint, if it was, okay, I got arithmetic, I get, I get multiplication, I get division, et cetera, which frankly, I never really did. But let's presume I did. So you go from third grade and you have a kind of uh, curriculum process that you, you know you can't do the fourth grade work until you do the third grade work. It just doesn't work that way. It's not that you're just building ongoing skills that just need a little bit of refinement in the next era. Every era opens up, from my standpoint, something about your unhealed parts. So not only is the child yeah. demanding legitimately that you engage differently. But actually, there are things happening within you with regard to uh, that the parenting exposes uh, our unhealed parts. And so what's needing in that fourth grade to sixth grade or seventh grade to ninth grade or beyond is every era opens the door to what is now further intensified, clarified, exposed, that's still needing 
to be addressed. I think if that had been, if I'd had any clue, if anybody had even just said those words out loud, even if I dismissed 99% of it, it would have been so freaking helpful. (laughs) It is, I have to say, like, it is really helpful because I am grateful that I've had that sense and... And it's, it's, and? it's still, and it's still brutal. It's like, I knew all this was going to be true, but I still underestimated what it would feel like. What, what would be exposed in me? Like, you know, uh, like what, how much healing is still, needed? <laughs> you know, because it's like, it's not just, oh, you know, well, one, it's like I'm watching my child that is fearless. She's fearless. She is fearless. And I am not a fearless person at all. Like, that's not my story. That wasn't my story at her age. Okay, I see you shaking your head. I am very courageous. I am very courageous. I can own that. And maybe without, like, terror and trauma, I would have been more fearless, I guess. is. I know it's a redemptive thing to witness her. But the amount of like cortisol that's flooding at all times and the intensification of my Mm hypervigilance, you know, to try to keep her safe, especially now that she's mobile. Um, And I think we talked about this, like, so like this sense of like, you know, I'm not gonna, I am not going to burden her with my anxiety. Mm-hmm. And yet, I need her to know the world is a dangerous place. <laughs> well, let, let, let's slowly move through this. Like, I've seen pictures. I have enough story of your life to be able to say, you have lived a ferocious and intense and passionate life, particularly on behalf of others. Mm-hmm. But in that, uh, for countless reasons, uh, you also had to bear a, a lot of cortisol, a lot mm-hmm. of stress biochemicals. So in some ways, your courage is even deeper than those who seem to be fearless because you did have profound fear, but you also had an incredible ferocity of engaging that which was uh, contrary to goodness uh, and with a deep desire to see goodness grow, whether it was within your family, within the church, within your friendships, within the... So you, you, you'd you have a hard time differing with what I just said. No, that feels true. That's but I received that. <laughs> but your daughter is not going to bear your anxiety no, because have you have created a different world than the world that you, in one sense, came to being in. So if that's accurate, then in some ways, you're you're going to war that she doesn't feel more anxious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe have to deal with my envy, you know, that, right. Cause we, we haven't even talked about throwing envy in there uh, and in this kind of parenting journey. Um, but it's just like, you know, I think it, what, what I hear you saying is there's so much of us that like, you know, with those unhealed parts of us, like I will never do, you know, a b or c you'll never lack these things and i remember you saying one time in grad school look your kids are going to go to therapy all right like you're not god you're not perfect like they're going to go to therapy because of your failure of love Mm -hmm. but may it be so that it's they don't go to therapy for the same reasons you did you know and so i've often thought about that and i'm like oh but that's gonna be the the funny like the humor of God that, you know, Evie will probably go to therapy of, you know, for like, you know, my mom just never let me suffer. She's always trying to comfort me. And, you know, so it's like, I'm having to grow my resilience and like, it's okay that she cries sometimes. And like, I can let her sleep in her crib instead of like contact naps, which again, that's like a whole other thing. But you know what I get? It is like that funny place of like, in some ways trying to react to places I still want healing. I can almost go to like the other extreme and then feel like a terrible parent Mm -hmm. when like, I can't prevent my child from suffering. Yes. Yes. And in one sense, there is not a parent listening. uh, Or if you're not a parent, you need to know that there is not a parent listening that does not at some deep level say, I would give my life 
uh, to make sure you are not in heartache or in pain. And on the other hand, if you expose my failure of love, <laughs> I'll kill you. It does. I see your notes here and I'm dying laughing. Like <laughs> you will feel loved. You will be happy. You will feel great or I'll kill you. <laughs> and it's like how often that's playing out. I mean, I think I've said that on here. Like, you know, I'm trying to give her Tylenol or like do something. And she's like, in your face, I hate this. And I'm like, why child? Why? You know, and in this moment, I feel so exposed. Am I I mean, again, I can, the frame is I am sleep deprived. Um, There's like a whole, there's a lot going on. I have stress biochemicals. I have, you know, hormones, all the things, but I also have a tiny human being who's rejecting my help, rejecting my care, rejecting my love does not feel gratitude. And I would love to say in those moments, I'm like, Oh, this is just a tiny human. She's it's not personal, but you know what? It actually feels deeply personal. In yeah. those moments. And and that tiny human, I, I have non tiny humans. Uh, and Evie is less than a year, eight months. Um, and my rather physically present, capable, ambulatory, articulate, having jobs, adult children, they're not going to take aspirin for me either. <laughs> and that reality of, you know, this, this process of every eon era, I don't want to say every literal year, but there is a sense in which, again, they're exposing both what I have not done well, but yeah. also what was not done well with regard to my own being parented. So again, this strange reality of I am a father and I need to be fathered. Uh, I, and I was not mothered well, and I need mothering. And mm. I need to be a mother and a father. I need to be the presence of God, who is neither male nor female. I need to engage and be engaged in order to have this kind of reciprocal interaction. And, you know, in other podcasts, I've talked about the reality that my children, uh, my daughters, my son and son in laws have mothered and fathered me just by how they parent. Seeing good parenting anywhere, but particularly with one of your children, I would never have been prepared for how nourishing it was for me, but also a sense of I'm receiving something vicariously. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll also say my son-in-laws have fathered me directly. Mm -hmm. My daughter-in-law and my daughters have mothered me. And it is good. If it's a demand, then yeah, we've got some problems. But I think we failed to see that the universe, the, the, the reality of the creation God has made w- w- is reflective of God's presence as both father and mother. So mm. why would we not presume as he has made water uh, that we are thirsty? And in the same way that he is father, he is mother, of course we need to be mm. fathered and mothered. And so it gets even better and harder to think in terms of these. Like I'm meant to be exposed, but I'm also meant to receive and I, you know, another place of re- of receiving that I feel like has been really true for me is watching my parents' grandparent. And I know that's like that may not be everyone's experience, but I feel like I'm getting reparented by my parents in ways that they probably have deeper capacity for than they maybe did when they were really young and had four small children and starting out in careers in life and just learning a lot about themselves. So like watching them with my niece and nephews and now watching them with my daughter and my sons um, is, has been like a really powerful vicarious form of parenting. Um, Sometimes I have to be like, Hey, what about when I was a kid and you didn't let me like, we didn't get to eat all the snacks we wanted. And, you know, like, (laughs) so it it is, there wasn't like, you know, Papa's, Game room wasn't like nobody says no in this room. I mean, you know, just the funny things they do as grandparents that they can do because they're not 
parenting and like you know in the front but so when we begin this process of saying look the eternality uh, of of being a parent and needing a parent is such an intersection that most of us have not let ourselves say what do i need that i did not receive from my mother or my father and what is it i'm meant to give as a mother or father to my children whether they're 8 months old or whether they're 42 years old mm -hmm. and i think just frankly having that question before you uh is uh, such a gift because it does open up this frame again of what am i needing to see and engage with regard to now my grandchildren's lives you know when gus who is now 5 um when he was 4 it, he is an incredibly playful, wise, and articulate young boy. And I began to name for myself, what would it be like to be four years of age? Uh, I've mm -hmm. dismissed that because that's the age that my father mm -hmm. died in an auto accident that my mother and I were in. And I'm like, it's easy even after having my own children before and realizing, oh, a four-year-old is quite cognizant, mm -hmm. often quite verbal, able to name reality in ways age appropriate that you would never really expect. And having again my four-year-old grandson naming things about me, uh, about our relationship, uh, we, mm -hmm. we were going to have uh, a dance party and uh, and like five minutes in Gus looks at me and he goes you're really awkward <laughs> Papa <laughs> you, 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 you move so stiff well, you know try this and he's, he's just sort of teaching me how to dance and, and, and having a four year old name you're an awkward old white male <laughs> cisgendered uh like I'm going, is it humanly possible that age four, I knew a whole lot more than what I think? So I think having that privilege that our children, yes, are meant to be parented by us, but our children are also exposing not just our failures, but actually what it might have been like to be in that age. And yet mm. most of us have made something of either an articulate or unspoken vow, I will never be like my mother, my father. And often we're not. It only means that we bring other forms of harm and goodness. So I think being in that position to say, already, what are you learning about the nature of what you need and mm. where you have failed as mm. you deal with this stunning little oh, yeah. wild fierce evie yeah i would say i mean oh goodness um you know one thing that i i notice in her and she did it even this morning when i was feeding her is there are many times throughout the day where she looks at me and now she can say mama and she says it real sweet mama 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 and she'll look at me with a question like do you like do you like me is what it feels like she's asking. Like, do you see me? Do you delight in me? Are we okay? Um, are you paying attention to me? Like if, if I'm in a conversation, she screams in frustration. If she's not a part of it, I think you got to witness that when yep. we saw you. <laughs> um, but there's something about parts of me that just want to be delighted in not just, not just want to be, might have like my basic needs met, but like, just long for delight mm -hmm. and to be joined in that way to play, like to have someone want to play with me in delight. And I'm, you know, wrestling with that in my, in our work life right now. And what does it mean to, to want to be delighted in, in the communities you're a part of and, you know, not just tolerated or appreciated for what you do, but just genuinely enjoyed. And mm -hmm. 
and and I think because she's so little, it's like she just asks for it as much as she needs. And and I think to be to realize even though she gets so much delight that there's still a question in her heart. And, and the, so like to honor the question in my own heart and, and that I need like abundance, I need like an abundance of delight. I do think um, where like where I feel the most failure and this is so vulnerable to talk about. Cause I mean, I love being a mom. I am so happy and there's so much joy and the ways in which um, I have to contend with the cortisol flooding and the way, like for me, when I flood cortisol, it, it, it brings up a lot of rage. And because I'm so acquainted with that from some of the adults in my life, it is just brutal when I, again, I'm filled with rage. I'm not enacting it, but to feel it feels exposing, you know, to like, to be like, you know, feeling toward a, like a, the, this constant disruption and interruption of like a plan, you know, like you're trying to clean something, you're trying to finish a thought for work, you're trying to accomplish some very simple task that takes you so much longer to do because someone is interrupting because they have needs and they want to play or they want your attention or they want to be on you. We're in like peak separation anxiety mode. And so I think, um, the parts of me that just still need a lot of comfort and care that like, it, this is not a matter of life and death, but it feels like it's a matter of life and death. And I actually feel a lot of sorrow about that. Like I've, I've actually had to m- make space for grief that there's just still a lot of fragmentation in my body. And um, when I'm not able to soothe Evelyn quickly or, immediately meet a need I feel so threatened by that like it's it's a it is literally like a yeah like a fight flight or freeze response and so to know that there are unhealed parts of me that still feel terror if I can't like soothe or like like what chaos is going to break out if I can't accomplish these things even though it's different with the baby so that's been really hard. Oh, it's such well said in that sense of y- you have been uh, you've spent a lot of your life soothing others, and yet here more than any other world, it, you need a comfort to be able to offer comfort. And yes. it, and in the midst of the young parenting experience of exhaustion. But also not just the fact that you're up a lot and you're not having regular sleep. I'm not saying that that's like anything other than that's huge. But you have the weight of the future uh, in in a way that like, uh, yeah, that feels true too as well with adult children. Like they're... They're established in their work and career, but there's there's disruption in all of their lives. Mm-hmm. Things are not easy in any of their lives. And being able to hold worry, hold mm-hmm. it and not allow it to, in some sense, shape how you pray, let alone yeah. speak. I mean, yeah. aren't my children know that. Uh, uh, you know, one of my one of my kids said to me at one point, "I know you are always in a chess match, virtually in every endeavor. Already, sometimes two or three moves ahead of me, and it exhausts me to have to think about having to play a conversation with you." Mm. And I'm like, oh, and 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 I I I literally groaned, and and they're like, oh yeah, so yeah, but do you feel what I'm feeling? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, no, you're not exhausted. You feel sad. So what would it be like to engage a very bright man who's very articulate, who's also incredibly opinionated as Mm -hmm. to how things ought to be? I feel like I'm almost always at some level a constant disappointment. But if I differentiate, can you bear it? And I'm like, oh, good God child. You know too much, you think too well, and you're articulating exactly what would be a war if I had to be parented by me. Mm. So I think something of that realm of being able to go, now, can I enter that without the ferocity of my own contempt and judgment versus being able to, in some sense, own 
it's broken. It's also mm -hmm. beautiful. They've mm -hmm. been able to learn how to think very well, critically, and yet, oh, like uh, I had such deep conversations with them at a very young age, Kierkegaard, um, and in a way that was like, I, I don't know if I ever had a conversation that had any depth ever with either my mother or father. I think that's mm -hmm. where that I will not leave my children abandoned to the banalities of pointless, yeah. thoughtless, empty conversations. Yeah. And then I create my own version of hell for them. And mm -hmm. so holding this intersection of grief and honor simultaneously, a broken and beautiful of, of, mm -hmm. of, of the people that I would die for. And yet, as we put words to and laughed at one level, as they name the reality, there is something in me that's going, I'm still called to be a parent now. Mm -hmm. And has a parent to engage, tunement, containment. But here, the key word is repair. And I think <laughs> that that's the... It's, I think that that's, that's the call to like a very real, like resilient humility, right? Because there's almost this part of me, even though I know better, that's like, I'll only have to repair a couple times on that one thing. And then we've got it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I do hope that there are places I continue to grow and heal and change and, um, and not just like a. Oh, I'm sorry that I'm like this, but you just have to kind of deal with me, but like a genuine repair. Um, but it's so vulnerable. It's so, so vulnerable. It's all vulnerable because we haven't even talked about just the terror of how fragile life is and how scary it is when you love people and you would give their your life for them that you can't actually control reality. Oh. So, so vulnerable. Yep. And again, we think of death as like the the utter unnatural child dying before a parent i mean that has that has a, a war that i don't think any parent can ever escape especially with things like fentanyl you know it will your adult i'm sorry your adolescent children be given opportunities for entry into just like two realms, pornography uh, and, and, and drugs, of course. Where drugs may have been dangerous before, like we're talking a level of danger that is incomprehensible. So the reality of, of how much energy you bring to warning, to trying to keep safe, and yet knowing that... Uh, really good parents with really good kids have faced that mortal terror. And yet as well, just the realities that come, you have an adolescent and, you know, to not tell his story, I'll, I'm not going to tell my grandson's story other than to say, this is such an era. Uh, I, I look at parenting today and I just say, literally, thank you, Jesus, that I'm not raising children in the era of, you know, uh, phones, uh, iPhones mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. let alone in a realm in which uh, one misuse of a pill that has fentanyl could literally mean their life or death. So the the threat feels much higher today than I think it felt for me and certainly for my parents. So the 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 reality of we're inviting one another to the reality that you have to surrender without demanding control mm -hmm. and that you have to stay connected to your children without the confidence of of the outcome you know that y you <laughs> you can do everything brilliantly and you know there have been significant 
uh, folks who have moved away from goodness in life, even though they had great parenting. So I, I think some of this is such a human reality. And I come back to how are you finding mothering in our day? How are you finding fathering in our day to be able then to continue to engage y your three children? Mm. <laughs> you know, I think one, I feel very fortunate to be doing it with Michael and having a partner who um, is just very kind and very curious and engaged. And um, we laugh a lot because there are so many moments that we genuinely are like, what are we supposed to do here? Um, what are we supposed to do in this moment? Like this was not, this is not in the handbook. And actually there's not a handbook. Um, so I think there's a lot of just having to kind of like not revel in your human sizedness, but at least acknowledge like we are human size. And, um, and I think a lot of the things you said, like we're navigating things we didn't have to navigate as kids. So we don't actually have like a lived experience to draw on. I didn't have an iPhone when I was a kid. I didn't have access to the internet when I was a kid. Um, I didn't, you know, just so many of the things that they, that they have to navigate with their brain, like, let alone just like their personhood and relationships with like their brains and the ways it's shaping their brains. Um, so I think, again, I've said this, but I, humility, we have a lot of humility and a lot of curiosity. Um, they are, they are full on humans who have personalities and wills and desires, and they are different than us and they're different than each other. So how do we, in the same way we have to be curious about each other and, and understanding each other, we have to kind of move toward them with the same posture, even our eight month old who is mm -hmm. letting us know who she is and how she feels about things and what her needs and wants are. And, um, I think in that humility, like wanting to hear often, how did this impact you? How did this engagement impact you? How did this work? How did my presence impact you? You know, like I'm not the most stable, I'm stable right now, but I'm, I'm much more, um, like my emotional range is a little more robust in this season than like maybe my older kids are used to just with a newborn or an infant and a body that's still healing. And, um, and so trying to have conversations around the impact of that and in some ways getting to know a new part of me, um, that actually was very present when we first got married because, you know, my whole world had changed and that was a little traumatic, even as it was really good. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with the older kids being able to have honest conversations and really hear from them, um, we do a lot of work on like att attunement, containment, repair. What does honor look like it developmentally appropriately, but also what do, what are the right boundaries? Um, and how do we talk about those and negotiate those? So, it is a constant learning curve. And like we said at the beginning, in some ways, acknowledging that we are in a, we are on a journey in a landscape that is shifting and we're growing, they're growing. The world has changed in the past three to four years. Like we are in a different world than we were three years ago. Um, and so I, I will say my need and dependence on God has grown significantly. Mm -hmm. um, just desperately needing to hear from God and know God is with us. And that in these moments that can feel so isolating and alone. Um, and I think, yeah, like calling on community, calling on the mothers and fathers in our midst, whether those are people younger than us, our own age, older, you know, like taking in the mothering and fathering of our community. Um, and, and letting them mother and father our children too. Right. And, oh. and all of the above. So. Huge, <laughs> huge. Again, I, I think there's this interplay between vicarious, which we've underscored. And I don't think we make a, a use enough of watching any good parenting, whether it be in a TV show, whether it be watching one of your children, parent, one of your grandchildren, it, it's, it's will you take in goodness? And I think part of that is difficult because no one's parenting us at that point. 
and we are coming closer to, oh, that's what delight is. I've watched my daughter-in-law, Elizabeth, engage uh, one of her children with a level of kindness and calmness that is just like, I can walk away from that going, oh, that tasted so good, but it wasn't given to me. And so that that sense of, can I, can I still not take it, but can I receive it and mm -hmm. allow it to settle in me? And I had a good friend say to me, because I was talking with him about one of the struggles I had with one of my children. And he said, y you're finding some significant complexity uh, in this moment. I'm like, yeah, and I don't know what to do. Uh, and as you put it well, and there doesn't really offer any manual to know quote unquote, what to do. And he said, you know, and I told him a bit about how I'd handled it. And he said, it, it seems well, I, I, I love how you fathered your daughter in this moment. And, and then he said, and have you asked God to father you in the way you were fathering? Mm. And it, it, it was one of those sentences where I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's uh, what? And, you know, he could see my face and he stayed in it to say, um, what you offered, do you need? And I'm like, mm. oh, yeah, I need. And he goes, you're not going to find anybody, are you, who is really going to know how to father you particularly well? And I'm like, mm, that's probably true. So what does it mean for you to ask the father? to parent you in how you parented. And I found myself furious hmm. that you're asking me to want what I'm not sure that I actually believe God will give or, mm -hmm. or give in a way that actually will touch something of this unresolved, unhealed parts of me. So I think that's where the, even when you say your need for God, I'm like, yes, yes. Oh, don't, don't talk about this. <laughs> Let's just you know, leave it as a nice little spiritual truism yeah. and throw it out as a sop. But when you actually get down to it, where you know you need a mother yeah. or a father, can you risk feeling unparented again by God? to ask mm -hmm. for what it is you most deeply mm -hmm. desire. Yeah. I had like a really sweet moment like that. I'll keep this brief because I know we're coming to a close. But when I was, when Amy was maybe like three weeks old and already in her short three weeks of life, even though I had literally been feeding her constantly whenever she was hungry <laughs> and had more than enough. <laughs> I had an oversupply. So I had more than enough it was just so um, like ver what's the word? She was so ferocious in her need and, 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 and almost acting like there was scarcity. And I was just holding her and just speaking to her. Like there is not, there is abundance here for you and you can keep coming back and what you need. Like there is more than enough for you. And it was just this moment of really genuinely feeling the spirit say, if you feel this towards your like three week old daughter, how much more do I have an abundance to give to you? So why are you coming to me as if like you can't even get a 10th of your need met? Like you're asking too much when, you know, what you're saying to your daughter. And so I just, I do think that that those places where we need, we need that, that God parenting are very real. And they are very scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what, what we are to give, we are meant to receive. And what we are offering, we need to become. And only in the presence of being able to wrestle with that core question of, is there enough? Um, when scarcity feels like it is the reality of life. Um, mm -hmm. And whether you have enough money, whether you have enough X, Y, or Z, there is something in your very being that is voracious, that feels unsatisfied. And the idea that our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed 
be thy name. That Psalm 23 opens the door again to that question of, can we go word and verse by verse to ask, is, is it true? And will we receive what truth we are being offered in that? That's a sweet ending to be able to say, parenting is eternal because our parent is eternal. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org.